fans, welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. I am your host, James Just, and with me today is Alexander Vasquez of Capital City Radio here on KUBU 96.5 FM here in Sacramento. Thank and you. Alex, we just spent an hour or so listening to the Sacramento City Mayoral Debate down at the Guild Theater. It was presented by the um, North, no, not North Oak, just the Oak Park Neighborhood Association right. and uh, Act of Sacramento. So that was a... That was a very good, it was a very good debate. Very good, and um, and so it it was went very fast, you know. And I think the reason why it went fast because they've been asked these questions over and over again, and so they've had the time to develop an answer like real quick because their answers were really crisp and really fast. But it was the same old, you know, it was the same answer that you got the first debate or the second debate. And, and most of them. From my perspective, they were pretty empty answers. There was kind of the yeah. It, you could have you could have written the script ourselves, without having to hear them. It's the same. Um, I mean, they're both Democrats. They're both left leaning, leaning Democrats. Flo is more would be more on the progressive side. She's kind of more closer to the AOC wing. Right. And McCarty was more of a. I don't moderate. I don't. He's not a moderate because he's no. a union hack. Anybody who gets a hundred percent. Do the the score the grade? Right. He got a hundred percent grade from the from some unions, right? Right. And I wouldn't even get a hundred percent from the libertarian people, right? I'm I'd get eighty percent, eighty five best. And and so anybody who's got a hundred percent from somebody, you're in their pocket. Absolutely. And 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 so that's why he gets one hundred percent because they want to make sure he's one hundred percent bought. Okay. And um, with this with this race with Flo and and Kevin. The same, pro the same questions were almost identical to the same questions when Steinberg ran first time and the second time. Even with Kevin, uh, Kevin um, the basketball player, Kevin Johnson. Yeah. Okay? Um, Sacramento still has these problems. They haven't been solved. They haven't been addressed. They haven't been taken care of. We have a very ineffective government right now. And um, their complaints are the same complaints that go back eight, uh, eight, twelve years. Yeah, and you know one of the, the topics he brought up was homelessness. And Flo, she wants to do essentially repeat what Portland has done, which is an abject failure. Right. But I got to give her credit; she at least had an answer. <laughs> McCarty didn't even have an answer to the question. It was just like we're going to kind of do more of what we're doing. Yeah, and and that's see, Sac Sacramento has a problem right now. We are getting to that stage, I guess, where we have less talent out there. And um, because what we're doing is recycling old politicians. We recycled Daryl Steinberg, and now we're recycling Kevin McCarty. And so what you have here is the same old dog, just different flea on it, okay? And his answers are almost identical to what Steinberg said eight years ago. But Steinberg was going to correct this. And he never corrected it. And then he had the, the chutzpah to say, I know I didn't promise. I didn't promise anything. It just sounded like I promised I was going to you know, take care of homelessness. I just handed it over to Howard Chan. That's, <laughs> that's all I did. And I got five votes to do it. That You can't do that anymore. People want results. And I don't think they're going to get the same results. They're, they're going to get the same results as they did the last eight years only because what Steinberg said, and it's the only true thing he ever said, was that the city of Sacramento is not in the homeless business, but yet they keep pushing it, and they keep advertising it, and they keep campaigning on it, and that's why we get the results that we have now. Yeah, well, and we're gonna, you talked about some of the, the issues leading to homelessness. It's a complex issue, right? Right. Because some of it is, You've got a small group who've always been homeless, right? You've got this small group of homeless. We call them the vagabonds, the, the bums. The hobos. The hobos, right? Those have always been around. There's a certain right. percentage of that. You, you're really not going to do anything with them. You just kind of shoo them along, and that's what they do. And so for a lot of us, that's kind of the traditional homeless that people think of. Right. And then we got the drug addicts who fell out, who burned all their bridges, right? They no longer have any bridges. They no longer have the ability to, to pull themselves up. Right. And so... They've ended up on the street. And now we've got a third class of homeless. And this is where the real problem has. People who were 
functional in society. But because of the housing crisis that has happened in the last 15 years, the abject refusal to build houses at an appropriate rate has forced people that were otherwise functional into homelessness. And we saw it down here on Stockton Boulevard. They closed, they closed some of those last chance motels. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we had tents in the street. Yeah, because the people, you took the last place people had to go and you closed them down. Where were they going to go? Right. They had no other place to go but the street, but their cars. And so when we take away those low end, the slums, we remove that ability for people to get on that bottom rung of the ladder. If it wasn't for slums, I would not have been able to get on my, you know, get on that economic ladder. Right. Well, uh, right now with homelessness, what you're describing is people who have lost their apartments. Because the thing I, I don't like about the discussion right now, what people are talking about, is housing. They don't describe what kind of housing. Are we talking single, single home with a detached um, garage and a backyard and a front porch or whatever? Okay. Or are we talking apartment buildings? Or are we talking studios? The housing problem, I think, is that no one's describing it and how we're going to get it. Because even in some of these, like this Prop 33, it expands local authority to enact rent control on residential property. There's no developer in the right mind who's going to come into Sacramento and say, yeah, I want to build, let's say, 100 units, apartment units, one bedroom, one bath. And you're going to tell me how much I can charge them. That's not going to happen. So the politicians have also discouraged investors to come in so they can make money. I mean, this is a business. Housing is not a human right at all. Um, housing is a business, and somebody has to invest, somebody has to build, and someone has to charge rent. And the people that they're going to want are people who have jobs, and they can pay the rent. In the 50s, we had a housing problem, right? We had a severe, oh, yes. we had a real severe housing crisis, and it wasn't it wasn't solved by government building affordable no. housing. It was solved by developers building housing of all types. It takes the developer says, you know, I'm going to build a high end. I'm going to build a high-end neighborhood. Another developer says, you know what? I can build a 1,000 cheap houses and make as much money as that guy building his high-end development, so I'm going to do that. Right. And so all these various developers having the freedom to go out and build the houses and not having things like in the city of Sacramento is $90,000 for a permit to build a single house. <laughs> so just the building permit. This right. is not even anything else. That's just the basic building permit. Right. And it's a wide... And then you complain about, well... The, the, oh, corporate investors, right. the corporate owners cor coming in and buying houses. Well, yeah, because now all of a sudden housing has become a good long-term investment for corporations rather than the long-term investment for a, a, an individual. Well, yeah, and you have, but you also have corporations. They're the ones who are investing in buying 15 acres, and building 350 units, like they did back in the day, back in the early 90s, in Natomas. That's how Natomas got built. I worked on them. You know, I was a young man and working in construction. And yeah, we threw them together. <laughs> you know, we threw them together, and, but we filled it up. And the first thing that entered my mind about this, where in the hell did all these people come from? And Sacramento's population grew and we stopped building those type of corporate um, communities. I think the latest one that we have right now is right there next to the um, Art and Fair Mall. That thing is gigantic. I don't know if you've seen it. It's like three stories. They're like 600 units or something like that. But it's full. And again, I go, where the hell did all these people come from? They showed up. Well, I think part of what we're missing is I live in Oak Park. And so... One of the beautiful things about my neighborhood is every house is different. Right. Because you had, individual, you had individual developers. Some guy would buy four or five lots, and he'd build four or five houses. And I worked for them, too. That, that, that worked, that, you know, right. looked kind of similar. They, they'd use the same plans, but they'd twist the house. You know right. They, but, you know, you get one, one house on this block, another house on that block. And so on my block, no, no one house looks the same. Every house is different on, yes. my, on my little block, which is, which is a beautiful, wonderful thing. We will never get that again. N uh, no, I don't see it. We have the opportunity in the rail yards, and we failed. They could have, the rail yards still sit there undeveloped. 
right. all this time later, sit, they sat there undeveloped through this huge uh, housing crisis, through this huge uptick in, in housing costs, but yet <laughs> we still sit there empty when they could have parceled it out to you know, small developers, one house, two house, a block at a time, rather than wait for this one big, huge, massive development to come around because they wanted a soccer stadium. Right, and so you have to look at Sacramento. I always encourage people to look at, if you can find one, and if you can't do it on the internet, that's fine, and then have it printed out, and then have it exposed, have it blown up. And that is the map of the city of Sacramento. If you really want to learn about your territory and where you're at, look at the city of Sacramento. There's not that much land left. Okay, I think the only piece that someone was going to take it by eminent domain would be the executive airport, and that's about it. Yeah, and there's some out, what, out past, um, out south by I-5, out past the pocket. Yes, yeah, yeah. okay, and so you don't have a lot of options here, and when you talk about we're going to make it affordable housing or mixed use, what's going to happen? The NIMBYs come out. And they say, no, you're not, we don't want them here. Yeah. And well, one of the other problems we have here is, is one of the things that they all talked about on the debate, they both talked about the love of commissions. We've got to get commissions and studies. Yeah. And, and we're going to do this new program yeah, and that yeah. new program and promised all various kinds of things. But these are failed. Yeah. <laughs> you, you don't need a commission to build housing. You don't need to do it by vote. You don't need to have it done by a city council vote or a mayor's vote or wh whatever the hell it is. All you need to do is say, we got this piece of land here. We're selling it. Let the developer take the risk. Let the developer put what he wants to put in, okay? And because the minute we start regulating it too much, we're, they're going to pull away. And then you're going to find that the only thing we're going to be building or reconstructing is old motels. And the configuration of that, it costs more to reconfigure a motel room than just knock it down and build it from, from the ground well, up. Well, it's the same thing that they want to reuse some of those old office buildings. But you know what it's going to take to, re, to retrofit an office building to, be, to, be work, to work as a, an apartment building? Do, yes. I mean, you're going to have to essentially put in fake floors and, and run plumbing and stuff underneath the fake floors. Right, it, I don't see any other way to do it. It will be cheaper to raise the Titanic than to reconstruct some of these state buildings, especially if you get the um, Environmental Protection Agency in there. Okay, the asbestos, the, the, um, the tiles, the plumbing, the concrete, the drywalling, the AC units. Like I said, I've been in this business for a while, and... Um, it's not rock and science, my friend. It's not. Just the sewer. Just for me, I'm just going, just yeah. getting the sewers to work properly in those buildings from a commercial office building to a residential building. How are you just going to get the water and sewer to work properly right. in all these kitchens and bathrooms? You're going from two, three bathrooms on a floor to a bathroom in every single office in that floor, essentially, is what you're talking about. Well, and it's not just the bathroom. You also got the kitchen, okay? You also got a water heater. Okay, and you know you gotta take showers and everything like that, and you also got a if you put one in a dishwasher. Okay, so there's a lot of plumbing that goes into this, and um, it's not easy. And trying to skeleton your way into an office building, especially if it's because Sacramento we don't have skyscrapers. You know, um, nobody's going to fly buildings into Sacramento. They have to go really low. You're talking five stories, but still, there's just a lot of reconstruction that has to be done and a different kind of expertise and a different kind of contractor that's going to make, that's going to say, I can do this, but I can only do this by so much a unit. And in San Francisco right now, to build a 1,200, uh, no, a 400 square foot studio, it's cost almost $800,000. And a, a lot has to do with the labor especially if this city like Sacramento is a union town and they want union workers to do it, it skyrockets. Yeah, and then, of course, you have to take money from, tax money from poor yes. people to give it to the people, to give the living wages right. to union work. It, it's, it's a never-ending game. It's, again, the poor people end up paying the, the cost of, well, of I, their, 
Yeah, well, you, well, you, yeah, well, I think we have to go back to institutionalization to, with some of these homeless people because I see them in my neighborhood. I live in the heart of downtown Sacramento. I live a half a block away from the governor's mansion, 16th and H and 16th and I. I see it all the time, okay? And some of these poor people are not going to get well. I'd rather see them forced into an institution where they at least can die in a clean bed than die in the alley right behind my house or in the parking lot. And um, we're going to just have to do that. But we don't have the leadership right now. We don't have anybody who has the guts to say it. And that's also going to hold us back. As well, far it's also as part of the company. problem is you've got people like me who don't trust the people in leadership to pick those people correctly. We look in the past history, and in the 70s, we were putting perfectly sane people you know, away when last time we gave them the, right. the ability to put, to put those who needed to be locked away for, for their own good, for right. their own benefit, and the benefit of society. But they put people who didn't need to be locked away, who shouldn't have been locked away. Right. And so people like me, we don't trust the... Yeah, I actually agree I don't with trust, you. I don't trust them either. I agree with you. There are a lot of people who we should probably would be more kind and, frankly, cheaper for us to put them in an institution that can serve their needs. But I don't trust us to pick the people properly. Yeah, well, um, I know the governor had a, a proposal for a while. I don't know if they're, they're implementing it or not. Or they, yeah, I think they're trying. going forward. I, okay. yeah, they're trying. So you've got to have a judge. You've got to have a doctor. You've got a psychiatrist. You've got to have this and this and the other thing and everything. And, they, and they're just making it more complicated. I don't trust that method either. I think what you should just have is a judge to make it legal and a doctor to certify yeah, this person's chewing on his arm. He's not doing well. He's, he's this, this, and the other thing. Okay, we got we to put him in, in an institution. It, and, it, it takes courage, and we don't, have, we don't seem to have that. And you can put places like the ACLU or somebody else who, over, who goes through every six months and reviews cases and say, right, there's, there's, some, there's some other thing you could do to kind of have an oversight of that, a public oversight of that, and someone, and like they go and release a report. So there's some kind of oversight that can be done. Yeah. See, I, the first patients I would like to go into these institutions are the lawyers of the ACLU. That, that, <laughs> that would, now, now we're getting somewhere. Okay. Well, it's now odd. we're getting somewhere. The ACLU used to be a good organization where you could actually do that. Right. They don't even protect the First Amendment anymore. No. We actually have to move on because we've got to have uh, our segment from, from the fields, Richard Fields. He's talking about propositions. Okay. Richard is talking about propositions 3, 6, 34, 35, and 36 this week. So, wow. yeah, it's for about four minutes. Alex and I will be right back. Hi, this is Richard Fields with this week's Report from the Fields. It's election season, and as usual, a vote in the presidential election, other than a protest vote for Libertarian Chase Oliver, is mostly meaningless. Both Trump and Harris are promising to worsen America's already debilitating $35 billion deficit. There is a reason to go to the polls, though. Propositions. Let's look at a few of them. Proposition 3 would uh, change language in the California Constitution, which only recognizes marriage between a man and a woman. This is really just a formality. Federal law already supersedes California law on this issue, so it isn't in force anyway. Of course, libertarians believe the state should have no say of any kind on who gets to marry whom. Might as well vote for it. At least it's a symbolic step in the right direction. Proposition 6 would remove the California from the California Constitution the clause that says slavery is prohibited. Involuntary servitude is prohibited except to punish crime. This one is more complicated. To require those convicted of actual crime, violence against others, theft of any kind, and fraud, to actually earn their room and board while imprisoned seems reasonable. But to further punish through slavery those who are unjustly convicted of a victimless crime just adds insult to injury. Government takeover of many aspects of health care has resulted in stupefying increases in the cost of medical care. Prop 34 ostensibly decreases the amount that businesses 
administering federal and state taxpayer money spent on drug benefits can spend on marketing and overhead. Might be worth voting for or leaving blank. Exorbitant health care costs will be a reality until the government is removed from the health care uh, market to let market forces prevail. Prop 35 is another convoluted effort to fix problems caused by gover government meddling in health care in the first place. Right now, there is a tax on health management organizations to fund paying their own doctors and nurses and other providers more because the government price controls on medical services provided by uh, those providers is too low for their, uh, for their uh, in their opinion. The simple solution would be to eliminate the price controls, not to continue the tax that provides, that, the, uh, that pays the providers the difference between the price control price and what they want to charge. A no vote might inspire healthcare providers to lobby to fix the larger problem, which is government micromanaging healthcare. And it would lower a business tax, which would benefit whoever ends up paying that tax. I'm not sure how Prop 36 made it to the ballot legally because there are two issues involved. One is increasing the penalties for fentanyl dealers that would lead to a doubling down on the drug war, which has decades of evidence that it is ineffective. The other is allowing local governments to lower the dollar standard for felony theft below $950. Right now, thieves can walk into a store with their calculators and make sure that what they shoplift is worth less than the $950 and effectively avoid legal repercussions at all, over and over again. That's ridiculous. So invigorate the drug war, let, or let thieves steal $949.99 without repercussion. Voters have a real dilemma here of deciding which bad result is worse, or they can leave that proposition blank. That's this week's report from the fields. See you again next week. Yeah, thank you, Richard. You know, this Prop 36 is an interesting one because it's, there's a fix to Prop, what was it, 43? 47. 47. That, that Prop 47 went way farther than it, than it needed to for its actual goal, and it created a huge problem with retail theft. And so to solve that, you know, I'm not sure of this retail felony below 950 because they're not prosecuting felonies anyway, so I don't sure how this is really going to change things. But, and I'm... I don't particularly mind about increasing penalties for fentanyl dealers, but we also know that it doesn't work. It's one of those things. That well, you know, the um, 47, the bad guys were clapping. Yes. I, 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 got, I, got, a, I got a free uh, get out of jail card, okay, pretty much. And um, with 30, and I think people just got tired. And the store's owner, the, the, you know, Macy's, uh, I don't think there's a, a, a Walmart, I mean, not Walmart, Walgreens in San Francisco anymore. Downtown, look at downtown Sacramento. All the pharmacies are practically closed. And um, that probably had something to do with it. But when you go to Target, you got to push a button, get somebody in there, everything's pecks of glass and, and all that. You're talking about also a deterioration of our civilization. So we have criminalization and then we have civilization. Which one you want? because the two don't go together. And um, there are going to be people out there who are going to say, well, this is just a Band-Aid. Well, so was 47. That was supposed to be a Band-Aid, too. And it made it worse. What I don't like is that you have politicians who say, who tried to get rid of 36, not get it on the ballot. Now, who's a threat to democracy now? Whether you like it or not, it doesn't make any difference. The people have a right to petition, to sign, to raise the money, to make the signs, the T-shirts, and everything else, and put it on the belt and let the people decide. All right, so we're down to a couple minutes, but I want, we wanted to get to street safety real quick. Oh, yes. So there was a, in the, the mayoral debate, there was a discussion about street safety. And I thought it was most interesting was the moderator who brought up that he was driving in an Uber, and the Uber driver had hit a guy on an electric scooter. 
But then he kind of quietly brought up, I do have to mention that the guy on the scooter who's the guy who didn't stop. So it had nothing to do with the safety of the road or the design of the roads or any of that. It's that the guy on the scooter wasn't obeying just basic rules of the road. And yet, so the, the question is, so what are we going to do about making streets safer? What are we going to do about making sure these guys, people who... Man, I drive, drive to work, a mile to work, and I don't know how many times these nurses and doctors jaywalk in front of people. They don't look. They just kind of walk out into the street, mm-hmm. assuming that they got a bumper for a behind and if <laughs> someone's going to happen to see them. Right. You know, and it's frustrating. It is frustrating. Um, this is like blaming gun violence. Okay? Guns don't get violent. People get violent. Is this car violence now? Is it street violence now? No. It's the person behind the wheel that's the, behind the wheel that's the problem. It's the person on the scooter that's the problem. It's the person who's riding their bike, and I ride my bike all over downtown. I see this constantly. They don't obey the rules. How many, um, how many times have you obeyed this speeding rule? Never. I haven't. Um, how many people have driven drunk? Okay. Even though they know it's against the law, they still do it. It's a human problem. It's not a street problem, and I hope we don't concentrate too much on it and try to put more money into it, because there's a lot of organizations who are getting involved in this. They want more bikes. They want, well, they want more money to redesign the streets. Yeah. And, well, there's a lot of people. The people who redesign the streets get money, the <laughs> actual the, the people who, who um, market, you know, yes. promote it, the, they make money, the consultants make money. And, of course, what doesn't happen is the potholes in front of your house don't get filled because they're spending money redesigning streets that don't need to be redesigned. What we need to do is actually hold that, yeah, if you're riding a scooter and you blow through an intersection, someone's likely going to hit you. Okay. There's so many times I I have a big truck, V8. I can't tell you how many times I almost had people become hood ornaments on my truck just because they weren't paying attention either. It's a two way thing here. Yeah. And so, you know. So, all right, Alex, so we got a question. One last question from okay. the debate. All right, you ready? Yes. If you could teach a parrot one word, what word would it be? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. You know, vote yes on no, vote no on yes, and maybe on the others. And maybe on the others. And maybe on the others, yeah. It's kind How about of a, you? It's kind of an interesting question. My word is no, and I'll explain why, but it was an interesting question, and the fact that neither one of those two could actually come up with a quick answer. Because you know what? Uh, like I said before, they were debating before, and nobody came up with some a clever, you know, gotcha. I don't think it was a gotcha moment. No. I think it was just something to, you know. It was just, a, it little, was just an off-the-wall question. Show, yeah, just show a little bit about yourself. A little personality. And the answer is no, because no is the most powerful word in the English language. We want to thank you for being here. Thank you, Alex, for being thank here. You, thank James. you for watching. Thank everybody for working hard inside. Please remember to love everybody. 